Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. You know, I, I, before we get into the, the lesson for the day, you know, God has put a, a scripture on my heart that I want to put before all of you. Come on, Jason. You know, it says in Isaiah 50, you don't have to turn there, just listen. Isaiah 50, verse 4, says, He awakens me morning by morning, awakens my ear like one waiting to be taught. And I, I just got to ask you is that how you came to service today oh, yeah come on. come on bro woken by your god that yes, you're here that you're attentive that you're not focused on, on other things that you're not falling asleep uh that you're not letting the zoom itis get to you but mm. you are awakened like one that is ready to be taught by god himself through the scriptures i got that uh, challenge yeah. us that this is so important what we're doing. This is the type of thing we got to get off the couch. We got to get our heads off the pillows. We've got to get focused. What are we going to do when we have to drive Come back on, into Jason. San Francisco or into Burlingame or to uh, Berkeley or to San Jose State? We've got to start to run up now and have our Sunday mornings a time where we throw everything off. Then Come we on, clean out the cup. Then we get rid of all the cobwebs and we get focused on reading and being instructed with the word of God. I hope you guys Let's are go, ready bro. to have a Bible study this morning. Amen. On, bro. Ooh, Amen. Bro. And I know the series that we are doing right now is super, super important as we are going over the restoration series. Now, you know, I, I started thinking about even the word restoration. And if you look at like re, if you look at re, which is before, you know, the first two letters of many words, uh, what it means by definition, if you go down to the root word of it, it means to come back or again. So to do again. So like you, you've heard the word resent. That means you're reliving it. You're, you're going back to that which happened to you and you're living it again. Resent. And you've heard of renew. That means to make new again. And we have many words throughout the English language that have those two words on it, two letters on it, R-E. What we're talking about is restoration. This is the whole story of God's will with man. God had the perfect setting. It was the original setting, the OG setting in the Garden of Eden where he was walking with man. And since that time, He's been trying to restore, to again get back to a state where men and women have a heart for him, where we can actually be in the presence of God. And we know that it's going to ultimately be fulfilled when we go to heaven to be with our God. And there he will talk to us face to face and we'll walk in his presence. What an incredible uh, what an incredible opportunity we have. Restoration on, is what the Bible is all about. Last week, we jumped into the restoration period, which is really the time period where the Israelites went back to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. And, and, and really looking at these documents, we start to get understanding of, of the, the, the opportunities and the pitfalls of restoration movements. And we looked at the challenge from the book of Haggai, the Haggai challenge. And from his incredible documents, we learned that, man, you can be those who want to go back and rebuild. You can have the greatest attentions, but they say, you know, the, the, the path to destruction is paved with great intentions. And these guys had great intentions, but they started to build their own houses. And really, Haggai lays it on them that look at God's house while you're busy building your own house. They repent and they start to rebuild the temple and they do finish the temple of God there in Jerusalem. You know, Haggai also gives him this like cosmological perspective uh, of this future kingdom and the impact that all the nations would be shaken, the heavens and earth be shaken, and all the people would come into God's house and it'd be filled with glory. 
you know, then he reminds them, like, you can start to build God's house. You know, you could go to Bible talk and, and even be a leader, even be in the ministry. But if the Lord does not build the house, it's laborers labor in vain. And he calls them back to a covenant of Come on, bro. and righteousness and walking with their God. That even if what they build, if they're not doing it for God, it will become defiled. And then he ends out his book with this amazing vision really based off of the name of Zerubbabel, that God would, fulfilling the name, would purify through his discipline a people who would then scatter his seed of God's word and God's kingdom to all nations. And then we're going to get in today the book of Zechariah, and we're going to study out the first half of the book, and the title of all of our collective charges we have for you today is Zachariah's Future Glory. And we're going to get oh, into yeah. the first section of the book, Ooh, which is on, eight visions oh, that yeah. God gives Zachariah during a night's sleep. And we have some incredible men of God who are going to be preaching these visions to us. We have the, the man amongst the myrtles, which is going to be preached to us by none other than Jacob Bias. And then we have the four horns and the four craftsmen, which Come Matthew, uh, we're calling him Maddie Rodriguez. Oh, there it is. Ah! To us on that one. And then we got a man with a measuring line in chapter two. And Ole, newly dating Oradola, is going to be oh, there it is. about that. And then the clean garments with the high priest, that is going to be preached to us by Eric Schrammer time. And then finally, Kwaku is going to give us the incredible meaning of the gold lampstands and the two olive trees there in chapter four. And then I'm going to take the, the last three visions and compress it very quickly for a close, hopefully bringing the first half of Zechariah together. But let's get into the introduction of the book. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's go, bro. One, Come on, bro. It says, Come on, Michael. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your forefathers, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your e evil ways, your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, the Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. This is the introduction to the whole book, and it's entitled Return to the Lord. And a little bit about the timing here in correlation with Haggai's preaching. So Haggai preaches four different lessons over three different months. And Haggai starts his first lesson in August of 520. Then his second lesson comes in September of 520. And then right here, Zechariah gives his first, her, his introduction in October of 520. And then Haggai gives his final two charges in November of 520. And it really meshes well together. Come on, because bro. Because if you look at Haggai's last two lessons, that was the lesson of a covenant of faithfulness with God. And really, Zechariah paves the way for that message with this one here, calling the people to return back to God. Now, he's trying on, to return, but really the return he's talking about is to restore the Bible being the standard of their lives. And he says, you know, return to me and I'll return to you, 
He says, don't be like your forefathers who did not listen to my decrees. They didn't pay attention to them. They didn't hold to the scriptures. And he goes, hey, and what happened to them because of it? Not nothing good. And I think in the same way, a lot of us, we could look at uh, our families and our family history, and we can look at our culture's history, and you can look at any culture history, and you're going to see a disaster for the most part. You're going to see, a, you know, genocide. Uh, you're going to see incredible abuses of power. You're going to see racism. You're going to see hate. You're going to see destruction, any culture, anywhere on the world. So he goes, look, consider what happened to your forefathers. Did not the curses come upon them? And then he goes, you know, and what about my prophets? Do they live forever? The question being, no, but the message is, even though the prophets did not live forever, that God's word does go on forever, and God's word will be ultimately victorious. And Come that on, is bro. really the thesis of what we're going to get into in the next eight visions, is that the ultimate triumph and prevailing of God's word. And I'm so excited to get into it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our first prophet to preach God's word to us. Let's send it on over to Jacob Bias to talk about the man amongst the myrtles. Let's go over there now. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. All right, family. The man so Jacob. among the myrtles. Uh, that is the charge that I've been given right here. And I'm excited to dig into this first vision right here. And really, I've entitled the charge, The Vision of Getting Back Up. And I appreciate Fine. what Jason just shared right there and where we see the Israelites at. They know they have blown it. And now the call is to repent and return to the Lord. And talking about the vision of getting back up, I mean, as a disciple, I mean, that's just something you've got to be able to do time and time again. And, and I love the proverb, Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. So for us as disciples, we become experts at getting back up. You know, Winston Churchill said, success consists of going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm come on jacob my favorite stronger and stronger and getting better and better but i love right here let's dig into it zechariah chapter one and verse seven the man among the myrtles and verse eight we'll start in verse eight during the night i had a vision there before me was a man riding a red horse and he was standing among them the myrtle trees in the ravine behind him was red brown and white horses and i asked what are these my lord the angel who was talking to me answered I'll show you what they are. And the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees. We have gone throughout the earth and found that the whole world is at rest and in peace. And then the angel of the Lord said to the Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem, from the towns of Judah, which you've been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel was speaking to me, said, proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I'm very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but then they added to the calamity. And therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'll return to Jerusalem with mercy. And there my house will be rebuilt. And the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again will overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. The vision of getting back up. Right here, Zechariah has this vision in the night, and again showing the, the dark state of where Israel is at. And he sees this man among the myrtle trees. And this man, the Bible says, was on a red horse. Well, we know a horse always signifies battle signifies victory. In red, we know that color consists of anger and passion. And behind the man were other horses, red, brown, and white. And he's standing among the myrtle trees. Well, in this vision right here, what the myrtle trees represent is actually Israel. It's Israel. And the Bible says they're in this ravine, showing Israel is in this lowly state, this humble state. 
And they're not likened to the cedars of Lebanon, which are majestic. And they're not likened to the oak trees, which are strong. No, where Israel is at, they are this humble, lowly, myrtle tree. And in verse 11 says who this man is. And it says it's the angel of the Lord. So we know when it talks about the angel of the Lord, that is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ right there. And this is great for us because showing that even though God's people might be at their lowest of lows and at times in this lowest state, who is standing right there among us is Jesus Christ, who is held to his promise, I am always on, bro. with you. Beautiful, beautiful. Go, bro. And so these other horses, Jesus says that they, they, they've gone out. And so they're literally patrolling the earth. And where they find the world is that the world is at rest and in peace. And this might sound good, but it's not good because we see God's heart. He's like ticked off that this is where the world is at. But basically what that means is that the world is fine where, where God's people are at. They're fine with where the church is at, and they aren't doing anything to help God's people. And so the angel Lord cries out, how long is this going to go on? And God responds with kind and comforting words. And you see God's heart in verses 14 and 15, where God says, I'm a jealous God. I'm very angry with the nation. So he's ticked off. And so you see God's heart. He's ready for battle. He's ready to do something. And what he's calling Israel to do is to get back up. It's time to rebuild. It's time to go to battle. And I believe with all my heart, this is the same vision that God is calling us to see every single one of us to have that, you know, that it's time to get back up. We might be in this humble state. You might, you got to see where you're at, but see that God is right there. And he's calling us to repent, to get back up and go build his house. For on, his glory. That's God's vision for us this morning. Come on, bro. Come Let's on, go, bro. Jake. Take the, you can't see that, bro. Come on, Jacob. You can't see it till you're in that humble state. And God, you know, until we're humble. And sometimes he's got, and that's why he allowed him to be in that humble state for 70 years. And I'll never forget, in 2014, or Cordy and I made the decision to step out of the full-time ministry to come down to San Francisco to be with Jason and Sarah. We started leaving the Eugene Church in 2012. And it got rough. We were totally untrained. And, you know, and I was an untrained doctor in an ER room, only know how to put a Band-Aid on something. I didn't know how to perform surgery. So I see like, hey, man, I got to, if I'm going to do this, I got to get help. So 2014, we stepped out of the full-time ministry, moved down to the Bay. But I came down just, just broken, hurting, lost my vision. Didn't even know if I really wanted to go back into the full-time ministry. Didn't really I don't know if I, I, I wanted to be a minister. I was like, hey, let's just go back to Starbucks. Let me just go back to that grind. Let me manage a store and build a great life. I lost my vision. I allowed discouragement and bitterness, even my own impurities and just my sin to overtake me. That it's really just, 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 just I lost my vision. And, and the Bible says when the people lose vision, that you know, the people perish when they cast off restraint. And I remember my first tea time with Jason, he's like, he, he said, and he challenged me like, Hey bro, do you want to, do you want to be an evangelist? Do you want to go into full-time ministry? I'm like, I don't really, I don't really know. He's like, Hey bro, I'm going to ch challenge you right here. I want you to fast. I want you to come back next week. I don't want you to tell me what you want to do. And I appreciate that. But what I, what I got, as I got open with Jason, I shared my heart. And many of us can be afraid to share what's really going on. But I, what I found was the same way that, that God found the Israelites. That there was mercy. There was grace. There was compassion. And he, and he fought to restore back my vision. I came back a week later. I was like, bro. I prayed, I fasted, I'm ready to go, and we got to work. And in 2015, I was an appointed evangelist in the kingdom of God, and we were sent out on the Sacramento City mission. Let's go, Jacob. Let's go, Jacob. Come on, Jacob. Oh, Jacob. Come on bro. I put before you, none of that would have happened unless I just humbled myself, and I saw where I was at. And I trusted God, and I trusted the people in my life to restore that vision back. Because God was still not done using me. And it's been awesome to see what God has done through me to the grace Man, of God and where we've gone over in SAC and then now back here in Berkeley. And now we're here in Hayward, the heart of the bay, amen, and fired up. But I got to ask you, like God sees where Israel was at or the nations are at, have you gotten 
restful and peaceful with where you're at? Have you become unconcerned like the nations just with not building God's house and doing your part? In the same way, God is asking you how long, if you're in that state right there, and you know that God is trying to restore your vision back, he's asking how long are you going to be like this? How much longer is it going to take for you to repent and get back up and fight and rebuild God's house for his glory? And Come I on, bro. Some of us, it might be time to, to get humble, to be humble, to, to embrace the kindness and the comfort of God to rebuild this house for his glory. Maybe the challenge for you is, is to allow yourself to be broken, to be filled with God's grace so he can use you in a great way. And when any man or woman is filled with God's grace, man, they can do incredible things. And I'm going to close right here with 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the myrtle tree, interesting enough, though lowly it is, the special thing about that myrtle tree, if you go and look at these pictures, they actually have these flowers. And when these flowers are crushed, they send out an incredible aroma. And that's what we do as disciples. And it made me think of this scripture right here in 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 2, in verse 14. I'll close with this. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession, in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him wow we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing family I put before you no matter what is going on God is always leading us in triumphal procession because just like Israel Jesus was right there but if we embrace the grace of God if we allow ourselves to be broken Man, that aroma can go out to a lost world, and we can truly build God's house for his glory. Let's have the vision to get back up and rebuild God's house for his glory. I love you very much. Come on. Woo. Come on, Maddie. Come on, Maddie. Come on, guys. Let's go, Matt. Let's go, Matt. Come on, Maddie. Uh, my name is Matthew or Maddie. Uh, it's Jason. Oh, Matthew. Let's go, Maddie. Oh, you're doing Let's great, go. bro. Maddie. Bibles over here to Zechariah chapter one and verse eighteen. Great, bro. And uh, in verse one, the Bible reads: Then I looked up, and there before me were four horns. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, "What are these?" He answered me, "These are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem." Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I asked, "What are these coming to do?" He answered. These are the four horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head, but the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. Now, I believe this is one of the coolest passages of the scriptures. Once I got to study it out and really dig into what it had to offer for us oh, this man. morning, it was come so on, awesome. Bro. Because, as we know, this is the time of uh, the, the exile when Zechariah and Haggai are pairing up to be the catalyst to rebuilding the kingdom here. And what it teaches is that, that God said that there would be, there, there would be four horns. This would represent very, like, directly historically that it would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Now, the cool thing about this is that the, four, the number four, just like the number seven... Is actually the same, the same meaning for completeness, which gives us the insight that this is to represent, this is what the nations that had scattered all of God's people, that have gone after all of God's people, that have terrorized them in this time. And it would have represented not just this time, but for all time, the complete enemies of God's people. And it says that this na these nations had the people scattered. They were in fear. They were weak and unable to defend themselves. But this is a message of hope from Zechariah. What he was teaching here is that, hey, God, just as these, these people have scattered my people, there's hope coming. Four craftsmen are coming. What would be the hope? What would be the hope for the people of God, the hope for the nation, the, the, the hope for the people that are supposed to be the people of the Almighty? It would be these craftsmen. The title of my short charge for you is The Only Hope. It's so cool because Come on, it bro. teaches that it, it scattered these oh, people. Man. It says that craftsmen would be the hope. 
craftsman. In other words, for this, I looked at, I was, I was digging into it. I was obviously very interested. And there's this word artificers, which is a skilled craftsman or inventor, which I thought was super cool. But the other word that, that it uses is smiths. Now, it's, it's basically applied to people that have, they work with wood, stone, metal, and you have to think about it. Why would they be the hope? Because what do smiths typically craft? What do they usually mold? Swords to go and fight this battle. And we have the sword of God's word, which You're is super Let's go, Matt. Come on, Matthew. Come on, Matt. And in the scripture, what it would represent is God's appointed agencies, human agencies, which would represent us, to go and overthrow these powers, to, over, to stop them from terrorizing the people of God. And the number, if you look at it, it says four horns and the four craftsmen, meaning that it's the complete enemies of God, but it's also the same number for the craftsmen to represent that they were adequate to go and execute the task for which they were appointed, which means that they would have the ability to overthrow these powers. Come on, come on. Let's so awesome. go. And, you know, I believe for us, we can relate to this in a great way, more than I, I think we probably thought initially. We can relate to this. It says that, it was the four, the four horns, which would mean the whole world was surrounded in darkness. Mm. And I believe if we look at our world today, and I believe the pandemic has given us a greater insight into just how dark the world really is. Yep, come on, bro. It's given our eyes so clearly see how deep the, 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 just the distress of the world Rape, suicide, divorce, human trafficking is a $9.8 billion business in America. This world is sick. This world is dark. This world is dying. And I think we, we, we have to understand, I think we got to get as frustrated as God would be as he looks down on the earth. Come on, bro. I believe we're living in a similar spirit bro. that when God looked down on Egypt, he said, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And I've had enough. And I believe God looks down on the earth and he says, I've had enough. And so I'm sending in the craftsmen. I'm sending in the smith. I'm sending in the blacksmiths with the swords to conquer these powers. Come on, bro. Come on, Matt. I think we've got to get frustrated and understand we're in a fight, guys. We're in a fight. We are in a fight, but, but I think we can understand intellectually this is a fight. But I got to ask you this morning, do you have fight inside of you? Does on, it make bro. you as angry as it makes on, God? Yeah. Does it tick you off that, that the world is the way it is? Or are you desensitized? Or are you indifferent? Do Come you on, bro. care? Let's is go. it just what you accept reality would be? Or is it something you want to change? See, we have a decision to make. The hope for this world would be men and women that would decide to be craftsmen. But I think it's a double meaning there. To not just be craftsmen, but to choose to be crafted by the creator. To be choose to be molded into the sickles that would reap the harvest and change this dark and dying world. I believe this is what God is hoping for. This is what God looks down at this Zoom service right now and says, this is the hope. You see the full, complete world filled with darkness. You see the fires that are literally physically surrounding the earth. And you see it so spiritually how we're surrounded by a dominion of darkness. And Come on, man. at us. And he says, you're the hope. You're going to change this place. Yep. You've got to be a craftsman. What does it mean to be a craftsman? You know, I believe it's, it's somebody that gets fascinated with getting effective on how to use God's word in a way that will demolish strongholds, as it says in 2 Corinthians 10, that we would be those, as it says in Isaiah 61, that we would bind up the brokenhearted and set free the captives. And we would declare the day of vengeance for our God. Every time we sit down in a Bible study, every time you sit and look at God's word, it's your moment in the morning to get handcrafted by the creator, to be a craftsman, to, to bring the sword to this lost and dying world. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know, Let's go. When I think of men and women that want to be craftsmen to take up the mantle and go to war against these powers of this dark and dying world, I think of the Berkeley campus ministry. Come I'm on. so inspired by what God is doing here Come in Berkeley. I cannot tell you enough how, how, how it just takes me back like, wow, God is doing something incredible. It brings me to tears. I mean, the brothers are here every day at the house and we're, there's, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. 
I mean, you got you got JP, you got Nick. I mean, they're all sitting right here in front of me. You got Jeremiah, you got Rashad, you got Grizz, you got, I mean, Kristoff. I mean, it's, it's incredible. You got Mo, you got Isaiah, you got Matt Bradley. I mean, it's amazing. Wow. These men that, that have not just decided, hey, I just want to be a good church goer. It's enough for me to just go sign on to the meetings. No, these men are bent on conquest, bent on getting effective so that they're not just bystanders, but they're also proactive in the war and the mission for God. That's cool. Changing what That's they see out. around them. These are men that have had enough. They've had enough of what they see, and they're not going to just stand by and watch. They're going to change it. And I particularly want to lift up Matt Bradley. I'm a... Uh, I'm Let's super go, proud of this, Matt brother. Uh, I, I, there's just a particular moment where I, I saw just God, his spirit just working so powerfully within this man's heart. And uh, he, he hit me up a couple days ago and was like, hey, bro, come pick me up. Let's have D time. And we had a great talk. And he said something that really stood out to me that showed me where his heart, where God is really molding his heart. And I was so inspired. He said, I want to study my Bible because I want to be a leader. But I don't just want to be a leader on the court. I'm not just talking about on the court. I'm talking about in life. And I was so inspired because it's the evidence that God, when, oh, Matthew. You, when you actually look into the Bible, apply it to your life, and you actually look at the world for what it really is, you see that there's a need not for you to just get so fired up about your future, but to get fired up about making God's dream a reality. Come on. Come on, now, I want to challenge us this morning that we've got to get – crafted by the creator to become the craftsman to change the world. But if you're content with where the world is at and you just don't want to do anything about it, don't complain about the catastrophe that contends for your very soul. See, the world doesn't have a shortage of humanitarians. It doesn't have a shortage of doctors. It doesn't have a shortage of people that know that there's something wrong with the world. It has a shortage of blacksmiths willing to wield the sword to change what they see. Because humanitarian is a drop in the bucket at what the world needs. It's not a physical issue, I tell you. I put this before you, it is not a physical issue. We have the resources to change world hunger. We have the money to make a real difference, but it's not that, it's people that lack the spirituality, that lack the biblical conviction. I'm talking about those that claim to be Christians, those that go to church, and even some disciples. Oh, We've got to become men and women hungry to get effective to be the prolific speakers that can shock the world with revolution. Come on, bro. Come if on. don't do that, then just hand over the world to Satan then. Go. Hand your family over to Satan. Hand your future over to Satan, and he'll show you what he has to do with it. Make a decision today. Make a decision today. As disciples, I think we need to get fascinated with this concept of just learning how to get effective. Mm -hmm. Fall in love with discipleship. Fall in love with teaching, rebuking, correcting. Come on, Matthew. Because what does the scriptures teach? As iron sharpens iron, so one man or woman sharpens another. We need to get effective at being world changers in our generation. It's not enough for you to want to make, you know, Jeremiah 29, it says that they'll give you a hope and a future. That hope and a future was that we would have a hopeful future in an evangelized nation in one generation. It wasn't about making your future bright. It was about making God's dream a reality. Come on. And Come I on, put bro. this before us this morning. This is not just one of the options that we have to actually make a difference. This is, in every real way, the only hope. And to God be all the glory. Come on, Matt. Come on, Matt. Oh, bro. Come on, Matthew. Come on, bro. Thank you for that, Matt. Oh. That was awesome. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, you better go ahead. Guys, well, let me go to Zechariah chapter two over here. Because title of my lesson and the only point is simply to God be the glory. Zechariah chapter two in verse one. It Come says, on. then I looked up. And there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered me, to measure Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. While the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him and said to him, run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of Fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape you who live and daughter, 
Babylon, verse 10, same chapter. Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. How awesome is that scripture? Here an angel tells Zechariah to measure Jerusalem, but it was nothing but theatrics. You see, this vision takes place on February 15th, 519 BC, and the temple of the Lord was not rebuilt until 515 BC, and the wall of Jerusalem not rebuilt until 466 BC. So here, Zechariah, when this vision was given to him, was seeing nothing but a flimsy, dinky foundation of a temple and a city with broken walls. Can you imagine? What was going through the mind of Zechariah when the angel told him to go measure this city in ruins? So another angel that we learn later on is the angel of the Lord of the physical manifestation of Jesus. Tells him, don't even bother measuring it. Because this is about a future glory. Jerusalem, one day, will be a city without walls because of the great number of people in it. And God himself will protect the people and he will be the wall of fire. This Mm. prophecy was not about the public people of this time. This prophecy is about you and me. It's about God's true church. You see, true church is all about growing to give God the glory. Let's go! Yes. It says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be disciples. And we know in John 15, verse 16, that God has chosen us to bear fruit, fruit that will last. This explains the first century church, and it needs to explain us. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. You have to turn, though, Bridges, please uh, pay attention. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts chapter 5, verse 14 says, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number that day. Acts chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in numbers daily. Then eventually you get to Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, where it says, every singer creature heard what it meant to be a disciple under heaven during that time. You see, the first church was absolutely, undisputedly a city without walls. And God wants to do it here in our modern day 21st century. This is what God wants us to do. We must restore the ancient ruins of Christianity that the former fellowship in the ICOC could not. We are not just a local church in the Bay Area. Yes, the word of the Lord is spreading in San Francisco, in San Jose, in Silicon Valley, in Hayward, in Berkeley, and Oakland. But the word of the Lord is also spreading in Miami, in Brazil, in London, and Manila, and all around the world. This is God's very modern day movement. And we are on the way to fulfill this vision in the 21st century. What can stop us? It's the same thing that stopped them. The Babylon system. Babylon's a motif in the Bible that represents the wicked city of the world. Spiritual darkness and a rebellion against God. The Lord's people are perpetually warned to flee and come out of that wicked city known as Babylon. Some Jews didn't want to come back and rebuild. 
Instead, they stayed in Babylon. They wanted to stay in their comforts. They want to stay in their laziness. They want to stay in their selfishness, their impurity, their morality, and these things that were plaguing them. And I believe in the same way there may be some on this Zoom call that are not absolutely escaping from the Babylon system. Come and on, Ole. Preach, bro. You, I just want to call you as a brother to repent from that way of thinking and focus on giving God glory and prove that you are a disciple of Jesus. You know, it's awesome in the church that this week we're going to see daily additions for the Lord. Wow. And I want to lift up a particular soul. I want to lift up Grace, who's going to get baptized here in Silicon Valley. Come on now. Let's, Let's go. go, Grace. Come on, Grace. Grace. She was originally met by Gilbert Rodriguez at Safeway right across the street. And they tried, they kicked us out of Safeway. We kept coming back and we kept sharing our faith. Amen. And it took a while for Grace to come on through, but she finally came to our regional service and heard the word of the Lord. And she started to study the Bible. You see, Grace grew up religious. But through the help of the awesome sisters in the Silicon Valley region, she learned what it really means to give God glory. And today, she's going to become our sister in Christ and get baptized. Come on. Let's go, Grace. If you are a guest here this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to inspire you to follow the footsteps of grace. It's time to give God glory, study the Bible, make Jesus Lord of your life, and get baptized Amen, into Christ. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, Amen. I want to inspire you to believe this message that God wants to make this a city without walls. You may look at the movement now. It looks dinky. It looks small. You hear the, all the great stories of the old times where we saw three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand disciples in San Francisco or New York and all around the world. And you may hear that and you may not believe that God's going to do it. But I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, that God will repeat this in our day. Against all all hope. In hope. Believe. Yeah that all nations will be evangelized. Without weakening our faith, we oh, face no. the fact that this is a colossal task. You, yet we will not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but we will strengthen our faith and give glory to God. Amen. I love you guys. Let's Amen. go, bro. Come on, fire. Amen. Come on, bro. Fire. Hey. Man, I hope you guys are tired preaching on, and preaching of Zechariah this Come morning. On. Keep going in Zechariah chapter 3, and we'll get started here in verse 1. You know, many of us have probably heard this saying, if you want to change the world, you have to change a country. If you want to change a country, you have to change a state. If you want to change a state, you have to change a city. You want to change a city, well, you got to change a community. You want to change a community, you got to change a family. And if you want to change a family, you have to change a man. The oh. only way to change this world Woo. is through a personal change. And this is the message, I believe, of Zechariah 3. Come on, bro. There must be a salvation in a man before there can be a restoration in the land. The title of my short charge in Zechariah 3 is from burning brand to budding branch. Zechariah 3, verse 1. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes, as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. You know, Joshua was the high priest. And here he is ministering before the Lord, before the angel of the Lord, which we know, as Ole just preached, is Jesus Christ himself. 
he's fulfilling his priestly functions as he normally does as the high priest. And here we have Satan at his right hand accusing him. God stands up for Joshua and says, leave him alone. Can't you see this guy is just snatched out of the fire? This phrase is only used one other time in scripture, and that's Amos 4.11. Speaking of Lot and his family being saved from the fire and brimstone that was rained down to burn up Sodom and Gomorrah. Come on, bro. It's symbolic of someone who is close to eternal death, yet was pulled out just at the last moment before complete destruction. You not only was he snatched out of the fire, but he was also wearing filthy clothes. The language here in the original Hebrew is literal human excrement. Now you gotta notice something here, and this blew my mind. Joshua doesn't defend himself. He knows who he is before God. And can I be honest with you? This is very difficult for me. I have a hard time swallowing this. That I am that much of a sinful guy. Come on, bro. To really understand this, this has been one of my prayers for 2020 that I pray every single day is, God, help me understand what you did for me at the cross. Come on, bro. Unlike Joshua, I can walk through my life not really seeing how much of a sinner I am on a daily basis. You know, I look at all the godly stuff that I do all day. I pray, I read my Bible, I share my faith, I study the Bible with people. You know, I'm a great employee. I'm a pretty good provider for my family, you name it. Yet here is Joshua, a priest, someone who we would think is pretty doggone perfect. And God says with compassion, no less, that he is nothing but a burning stick, snatcher of the fire. And on top of that, he's filthy from head to toe. You know, on the other hand, sometimes we can listen to all the encouraging things about how much God wants to use us, and we can still believe the lie that I am just too sinful. You know what? <laughs> You're right. You're right. You are just too sinful. I'm just too sinful. But we well, serve well, a God who can do anything. The only person in the yeah. universe that can do anything about our sinfulness is God. Yeah, come on, bro. God stands up and looks at Joshua, burning and filthy, and he says, I don't hear your accusation, Satan, because this is my man, and I've chosen him. Come on, bro. What come on, a faith-building image. What a faith-building image when we get the angel who gives the direction, take off his filthy clothes and put new clothes on him. You know, this is a picture of baptism. We go from death to life, from dark to light, from filthy rags to fine garments. This is what God's going to do with Erica Castillo later today in the San Jose region. Oh. And isn't this the picture that is plastered all over the pages of the Bible? In Exodus 19, verse 5, God says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession." Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you to speak to the Israelites. And then later on, come on, bro. In the New Testament, God says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, but you or verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, I love the way that this part of the vision closes out. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, while the angel of the Lord was standing by. As if to give his approval, you see the angel of the Lord, again, Jesus himself standing. And I'd like to think that he was smiling, ready to give Joshua that big hug that happens right after somebody comes out of the waters of baptism. But the vision's not done. Let's keep going. Zechariah 3, verse 6. Come on, bro. It says, The angel Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, 
you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? These are seven eyes on the one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. And that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under the vine and the fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. God did save us in spite of our sin, in spite of our filthiness. God saved this man from disaster to give him a purpose, just like he saved us to give us a purpose. But contrary to what the religious world would say around us, there's a catch. We saw in Exodus 19, verse 5, that there was a catch to being his treasured possession. This kingdom of priests, and what was the catch? It's full obedience to God. He says, you will be my people, my special possession, but you've got to obey me fully. You have to serve me with all of your heart. Joshua is told that if he indeed does this, walk in obedience and keep God's requirements, that he will have the right to do two things. Number one, he'll be able to govern my house. This is to be part of the kingdom and to lead in the kingdom. But number two, that he will have a place among these standing here. Well, who are these? It's the angels of God. This means that he will have the right to go to heaven and be with God someday. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus talking with his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, where he says, they come back from performing all these crazy, amazing miracles. And Jesus just looks at them and smiles and says, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Don't rejoice that all these awesome exploits that you did in my name, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. My brothers and sisters, do you see it? Do you see this call that God has given to each and every one of us? This is the gospel that we believed and acted upon when we made our good confession. I mean, think about it. We're all sinners in a filthy state before God, sinful and burning. We see that there's not even a priest, not even the most righteous among us is clean and clear Come on, before bro. God. Jesus, the angel Lord, takes our filthy clothes off. And as Galatians 2 says, we are then clothed with Christ himself through our repentance and baptism. God would save us, that God would pluck us out of the fires of hell, give us a salvation, and then call us into his service to himself and to the kingdom as his own special people, his own special possession as his priests. And after all that, the reward that we get for faithful service after we have restored his house is that we will get to be in heaven with him. And just to put the nail in the coffin here, look at verse 8. Verse 8, he says, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. All of this, all this imagery that we just walked through is a symbol. A symbol of what? The coming of the branch. This budding branch is none other than Jesus Christ. There it is. And what will happen when this branch comes? Verse 9, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Well, when did this happen? On the cross of Calvary. Wow. And what will be the result of the sin being removed? Verse 10. In that day, each one will invite his neighbor to sit under the vine and the fig tree with him. Sitting under the vine and fig tree is symbolic of living in peace with your neighbor. My brothers and sisters, there is only one place where you can find true peace in this world, and that is in the vine and in the kingdom. Come on, this is, is the meaning of the vision of Joshua. It is the gospel. It is our salvation. It is our own lives being plucked from the fire, cleansed and made new, as so that we can serve our King Jesus and bring peace to this world. My family, let us believe this vision that we have been cleansed from our filthiness, that God stands at the ready to defend us and call us his own special possession. And let us go into our cities. Let us go into our workplaces. Let us go into our campuses and call men and women from being burning brands into being budding branches and to God be the glory.
Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Let's go. Amen. Thank you so much, so much Eric, Eric, for an incredible, uh, incredible message. So Pyramid is the Karate Chapter 4. We'll tackle the okay. fifth vision in the book of Zechariah chapter four, the gold lamp stand, the two olive trees. Zechariah chapter four, verse one. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lamp stand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you become like level ground. Then he'll bring out the capstone to shouts of God, bless it, God, bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Let's pause there. In Zechariah chapter 4, the young man, Zechariah, as the Bible tells us, is wakened by the angel who is speaking to him, and the angel says to him, what do you see? He's awakened by an angel to see the vision that God wants him to see as a man who has fallen asleep. And it's so incredible because this is the plight of humanity. That from time to time, God on high, God almighty has to descend and he has to wake us up so that we can see with our spiritual eyes and see the perspective and see the vision that he has for us. God requires you and I every single day to have a paradigm shift. How is that possible? It means that every single day when I wake up and I look into God's word and I study God's word, it's an opportunity for God to wake me on up so that I turn a blind eye to the reality that I'm living in so that I can open my spiritual eyes and see the perspective, the vision that God has for me. And this is the vision he's given Zachariah. He says, what do you see? And he asks, well, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top with seven lights on it and seven channels. And there are two olive trees on the side with channels to it and um, the light's on. And Zechariah asked the angel, so what is this that I'm looking at? And the angel asked, quite perplexed, verse five, do you not know what these are? You can see that the angel of God, aka God, is perplexed that Zechariah, the prophet of God, cannot identify the lampstand that's before him. And this wow. is Come on, bro. Go with me to Exodus chapter 25. Let's go, Quakes. In Exodus on, chapter 25, we find Moses, the man of God who's leading God's people in the desert after he has rescued them from Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea. They've encamped in the desert. Moses has gone up onto the Mount Sinai there where God is. He's received instructions from God about how to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle was going to be a tent-like structure, which Moses was going to construct right there in the middle of the Israelites' camp. And it was going to be for them a place, physical location, where they can approach the glory, the presence of God. And as God is giving Moses there on top of the mountain there instructions about the little details and everything to put, we find this in chapter 25, verse 31 of the book of Exodus. It reads, make a lampstand of pure gold and hammer it out. Basin shafts, its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers and buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. Then make it seven lamps and set them up so that the light the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern that you saw on the mountain. This is the very first lampstand. God gives the details to Moses to put it together out of pure gold. 
And then he gives Moses the instruction that is supposed to be set up so that it gives light in front of it. Well, what was the placement? Well, it's going to be actually placed in the tabernacle. Turn with me here to Exodus 27. Just turn one over page. Come on, bro. This is what God says to Moses concerning the lampstand in 27 verse 20. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning in the tent of meeting outside the curtain that is in the front of the testimony. Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. And so after God gives Moses the plan on how to hammer out of pure gold this lampstand, he tells Moses, put it in there in a tabernacle in front of the testimony. And then all the Israelites are responsible for bringing you pressed oil, olive oil. Some would say, if you look at olive oil in the light, it actually looks golden color, doesn't it? But let's go on. He says, the Israelites bring you all this oil and they must give it to Aaron and his sons. And what is Aaron and his sons' um, responsibility? Fill the lamp with the oil to make sure that 24-7, the light of the lampstand is burning. So that inside the tabernacle, where there's no other source of light, the lampstand will provide light 24-7. And there in the tabernacle was where God would meet with Moses. It was a very presence of God. It signified the spirit of God, the presence of God there among the Israelites. But why a lampstand? Because, well, most of you would remember that throughout the journey of the Israelites from Egypt, before they got to the promised land, as they went through the desert, God would travel with the people. And what signified that God was with the people was that there was a pillar of fire in the sky at night, which was seeable, visible for every Israelite. And so they saw that God was with them. And during the daytime, there was a pillar of cloud with fire in it. And so when the cloud lifted, they knew God was asking them to move. And so they kept in step with the spirit of God and with the presence of God. Now back to Zechariah chapter four. Why does Zechariah not recognize the lampstand? Because as many of us know, Zechariah was a prophet who had returned with the exiles and he was preaching to try and garner support from the exiles to rebuild the temple. Zechariah most likely was born in Babylon during the 70 year exile after the temple had been destroyed. He had never seen the lampstand before. Wow. He never been into the temple of God. He never seen the articles, the details, the tables. He never seen it before. And so before. now that he's back after the 70 year exile, and the angel of God brings it to him, the prophet of God, the man of God of the hour is like, I don't recognize what I see. And so the angel says to him, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Zechariah 4, verse 6, not by power, not by power, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What was the lampstand? The spirit of God, the, the presence of God with his people. What well, God was trying to communicate to Zechariah, because at this point in time, the foundation of the temple had been laid. But as many of us already know, even though the foundation of the temple had been laid, the city still laid in ruins because it'll be several years later that Nehemiah would come to build up the wall of Jerusalem, build up the city around the temple. So they were building a foundation for a temple in the midst of a city that was lying in ruins. And so God asked the Quran, what do you see? Do you see the ruins? Do you see the devastation? Do you see the deplorable condition that people are living in? Or do you see the coming of the spirit of God, the presence of God that's going to come and consume the sacrifice of the people? What do you see? He says, this work that you guys are doing is not going to be completed by might or power, but it's going to be by the very spirit, the very presence of God. God himself is going to restore his people. Come on, bro. And I believe that the message that God was giving to Zechariah is the same message that he would have for us here in the year 2020, the year of vision. So many times I hear from different brothers and sisters, and I'll confess my own heart, my struggle, we're like, wow. What an incredible, challenging year to be living in with a coronavirus pandemic that has basically killed thousands of thousands of people all over the world. We have to walk around with masks on. We were even super scared because 
two sisters were contracted the coronavirus a couple weeks ago in the San Francisco region. And we're concerned that it's going to spread. And we're concerned that the campuses are shut. We can't go and share our faith. We can't have baptisms. How are we going to grow the church? I mean, people are losing their jobs. How are we going to give contribution? Everything's going to fall apart. We're in ruins. We're depraved. And God says to you and I the same thing he said to Zechariah. What do you see? Come Wake on, up wait, and girl. see the vision of Come what on, God is girl. doing this year. And this is what the angel of God will have you and I to see. This very same year, in the month of June, God blessed us and we blew out our special missions contribution. And we raised more money in June for special missions than we've ever done any year this year. We sent out the Come Dallas on, Quay, Supplemental Mission Team to Texas to more than weekly baptisms since the day they landed. We sent out the Oakland region, creating another region in this church, and they've had three baptisms, and today they're going to have Unreal. a restoration for additions to date. We sent out the Berkeley region, and we've seen more than weekly baptisms in Berkeley, California. Up to date, we've had close to 80 baptisms, which gives us over 109 additions and we are in the month of september by this exact same time last year we were close to 80 baptisms as well and to give you a little bit of context we closed out last year with just over 100 baptisms and about 110 additions we're already at 109 additions what do you think god is going to do for us this year let's over go. Three months to go we're going to blow it out and have more baptisms and more additions in the year 2020 when we're under quarantine than we even had last year we've seen incredible personal miracles Ole started dating and then this time friday jalen and asandra started dating just this year we've Ooh. seen Kevin oh, yeah. baptize his mother bernadette Christoph baptized his father, Alfie, and now his father and mother are united in the kingdom of God. We saw Matt baptize his mom, Janelle. We saw J Jahil's mother, Denise, get baptized all the way Come in on, Miami. Jahil. And yes, just like Eric Ram said, Erica Castillo is getting baptized today, and she just so happens to be the mother of Erigio Castillo in the San Francisco region. God Let's is asking me Come on, boy. Nice. What do you see? Mm, mm, mm. Go back Yummy. to Zechariah. Come on. Chapter 4. You're too good. In verse 10, the Bible continues. Who is it that despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. And for those of us who are reading from an NIV Bible, if you look down at the footnote, it says, these are the two who bring oil and are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Pause there. Zechariah asked one more time. So um, the two branches, you know, the two olive trees that are feeding in the oil, what's that one? And the angel's like, you don't know? Once again, the angel's a little bit shocked that this man of God is unable to see the vision that God is putting before him. As we remember in the Exodus scripture, when Moses would put up the lampstand there in the tabernacle, all the Israelites were responsible for supplying the oil. And then Aaron and his sons, the priest, and would basically fill it up to make sure that the light continued to stay on 24 seven. But in the vision that Zechariah is seeing, it's not a human being that's supplying the oil. It's actually happening naturally and organically because the lampstand in the vision is connected to two olive trees. And so the trees are basically producing the oil. And as the trees stay alive, they produce the oil and the oil just goes directly into the lampstand. And so once again, by the spirit of the living God, the lampstand will be, will be sustained and no human being would have to touch it, helping them to see that even in the past, even as the Israelites, the Jewish people, the people of God failed to keep the word of God and so failed to keep God's presence and God's spirit amongst them, this will not happen again. 
God himself is going to sustain his presence amongst his people. He's like, this time I'm going to rely on myself and not on you guys. But then why would there be two olive trees and what would they represent? Obviously different commentators come up with different opinions. And if you would study out Revelation chapter 11, John tries to explain to us what he believes in the apocalypse, what he thinks this may mean. Let's jump into Revelation 11 real quick as we bring this vision to a close. Come on, Quake, yo. Revelation 11. Come on, Quake, Verse 1 says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months and I'll give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand for the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Let's pause there. So in the Apocalypse, more commonly known as Revelation, John the Apostle, as he's exiled on the island of Patmos, sees visions himself, and he's attempting to explain to you and me what he saw in his visions. What's pretty cool in chapter 11 is that he begins by saying that he's given a reed like a measuring rod. And some of you might say, wait, that sounds awful familiar to what Ole preached about what Zechariah saw about a man or an angel with a measuring line. Yes, we don't have time for it right now. But if you study through Revelation, John is technically going through the visions that Zechariah also saw. But that's a lesson for another day. Super cool. He says that the two witnesses are the two olive trees. If you search through the book of Revelation, it's like, what olive trees are you talking about? You haven't mentioned anything. Yes, he's referring to the two olive trees that Zechariah saw that are going to continually, 24, sustain the lampstand and keep the fires burning. And he says, these men, these witnesses, have been giving power to shut up the sky so there's no rain. They can basically have plagues upon the earth whenever they want, and they call fire from the sky. Yes, it's a representation of the two incredible prophets of the living God. And these together, yes, give us the word of God, the message of God. So what's going to sustain the presence of God most high in our lives and in our movement is God's word. If you and I don't have a conviction to take our stand on God's word, we too will see what happened to the Israelites and what happened to our former fellowship and what happened to every group of people that have attempted to align themselves with God without relying upon the spirit of God. The lampstand will be taken away. But I'll close in the question that the angel asks Zechariah in Zechariah chapter four. Who is it? that would disdain or despise the day of small things. Many of us, just like our brother Olay preached, will look at the incredible church we're building here and we'll compare it with things we've seen in the past. And it makes us despise the day of small things. Some of us will look at the leadership that we have in this church and how young and inexperienced and sometimes lacking in maturity and we despise the day of small things. Amen, bro. Some of us may look at our Bible talk and see that like, wow, we only have three brothers and two sisters. And if I'm honest with you, I can barely call them disciples because I don't even know that they have quiet times. And we're saying, who is it that despises the day of small things? Come on, bro. The message of God to you and me is that it's not by power. It's not by might but by his spirit. It is time for us to take our eyes away from whatever it is that we think our devastated reality is and to open up our spiritual eyes and see the vision that God will have us have. And we cannot do that if we're not being sustained by God's word. 
if we're not being sustained <laughs> by the message that God himself will have for you and I, so that we can turn our back from everything that it is that Satan will throw at us. And we will say with complete confidence that it's not going to be by power. It's not going to be by might that we are going to finish the com- everything that God has called us to. No, it's going to be by the spirit of the living God that you and I are going to get the job done and we're going to see our world evangelized in our day and to God be all the glory. Come on, Earth. Come on, Earth. Come on, Come on, Come on, Come on Let's go. Go. Jason. And Guys, let's okay. give it up for all the incredible charges we heard. Uh, yes. I hope that this uh, fascinates you because honestly, I mean, there's nothing like the Bible. No one's ever attempted yep. in the history of literature to put together words like this. They were written hundreds and even thousands of years before these things came to being. Okay. And I hope it fascinates you. Uh, as I've been studying out the book of Zechariah, it has so built my faith. You ever had those moments where you read the Bible, you go, oh my gosh, the Bible's totally real. Like you believe that already, but it sinks yeah. in. And you're like, oh my gosh, no way. There's no way that just came together like this. Talk about it, bro. No way. I had one of those moments yesterday where I was reading this, see how it all fits together. All, it's like hieroglyphical, it's symbolic, it's literal, it's amazing. And it all fits together, giving us this cohesive, beautiful message. And I hope that it builds your faith. I'm going to quickly run through the rest of the uh, visions here. You know, after the vision that Quaker went over, you had the flying scroll. This gives us this incredible depiction of, of God's Bible being flown around. And it's got two storks carrying it. And it's, and it's actually, it's destroying all the enemies of God that set themselves up against God's word. And in specifically, the false teachers and it deals with them, and it says the house that these false teachers build, God is going to break it down to absolute ruins. And we live in a time where there's become so much false teaching. We have 41,000 different denominations of Christianity. This is what we're trying to restore. We're not trying to restore a totally committed, excited, fired up church. We're trying to restore the truth of the Bible. That then segues into another vision of a woman in a basket. And it's very interesting, you know, there's this basket. Now, a basket was generally used in temple worship in Judaism. They'd put the consecrated bread in there. Now, what was the the bread supposed to represent? Our daily bread, the word of God. So now in this basket, instead of being full of the word of God, they open up the lid of it and it's filled with... It's got a woman in there, a sinful woman that's kind of like a a small woman. It's to take the shape of an idol. So this basket that should be full of the word of God is now full of idolatry. And it says then two women will will fly this to Babylon where it's going to be dealt with the sin. And the two women, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of this. But we know that in Proverbs, it refers to wisdom as a woman. And it even refers to the church as a woman. And so one interpretation would be that the the two women that are flying this basket with this sinful woman to deal with that should be full of the word of God is the Old Testament and the New Testament, the wisdom of God that are flying it. And the, and the Bible will prevail and the wickedness will be removed from God's people and the basket be filled with the word of God again. Come on. And then it goes into four ch- chariots with four horses that go to the four directions, to north, south, east, and west. And this would represent God's word again, going out. It says these are are the wind or the spirit of God going to all directions, all nations. And one can't help but think of Jeremiah 12, who was a restoration preacher as well. He says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? And it says that they were straining as they were going throughout the earth. And I know that as we make disciples, as we go after in our Bible talk, as we have incredible deed times, that there's a strain that it takes to build the kingdom of God and get God's message out to the four corners of the world. And we've got to sit in that, not stumble, but race with these incredible 
incredible four chariots and four horses. On, and bro. then you get the, the crown of Joshua. And we're going to read a little bit here. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Come on, Jace. It says, take Let's the go, silver and gold on, and make a crown and set it on the, on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. You know, this is a very fascinating passage of scripture, because as we know, the main characters in this restoration period, they're going back to rebuild the temple, where yes, Haggai and Zechariah, but really it was Joshua the priest and Zerubbabel the governor, who was the rightful heir to the Jewish throne. And here it says, take the, the crown, don't put it on Zerubbabel, Rubabel, who it should go to, put it on Joshua. And then it gives us the prophetic message. We know that Jesus, another name for Jesus was Joshua. And it says, put it on Joshua because now the two are going to become one, that the kingship and the priesthood would be fulfilled perfectly through Jesus. And it says, he will build my temple, giving the, us the first shadowing of the spiritual temple the spiritual kingdom of god the true church of christ an amazing message there of a crown being put oh, on joshua and then in chapter seven we we hear about justice mercy and not fasting and this is one final time where zachariah is pleading with the people to please hold to the Bible. Let's read here in verse 11. It says, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and, stop, and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen so when they called i would not listen and here's a plea to not be religious you know these people would fast and they would do all these these different religious activities but they would not obey the bible they would and no amount of religiosity will save us we all have to surrender to the Bible, which can then provide mercy in our lives. It can make us wise for salvation. It could thoroughly equip us for every good work. It could change us completely. But if we will not submit to the Bible, no matter how religious you may be, you will see the ultimate justice of God in your life. Even when you call to him, he will not listen to you. Oh, and then finally, for this section of the book of Zechariah, the first half, we're going to look at Zechariah 8 in verse 3. And this is the promise to bless Jerusalem. It says, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. It won't be religious. All the false teaching will be dealt with. The basket will, won't have idols in it. It'll be full of the bread of God, and it'll be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with his cane in his hand because of his age. With the, the city, will, streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west, and I'll bring them back to Jerusalem. And there they will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them. I will be their God. You want an incredible, amazing passage of scripture of this promise that will come true 
for the people of God. If we do all that we heard about here in these visions, he says, I will come and live back in the city. Meaning God himself, that Jesus would come back and he would live in the church. See, God, Jesus never actually left earth because he left this church here that we can now be with him and he would live amongst us in the true church of Christ. And it's incredible. It says there'll be old people there and there'll be young people there. The old people have their canes. The young people be sitting in the streets, but no matter what they're young or old. And we see this fulfilled perfectly in Acts 2, where it says the, the young men will see visions, the old men will dream dreams, and they'll be totally united in God's beautiful kingdom. The promises have been fulfilled, on, and we're living it even on this Zoom call. And then he gives one final charge. In verse 9, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. You who hear these words spoken by the prophets. And you heard some prophets this morning who were there when the foundation was right laid here. for the house of the Lord Almighty. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. He concludes it. He says, guys, you've heard the prophets. We made sense of the visions. It's time to build. And it's incredible that as we close out this service here in just a couple moments, I know that many of us are going to hop in cars and to go to little bodies of water where we will lay some more bricks upon God's kingdom here on earth as Yuli's going to get baptized, as incredible people are going to enter the kingdom of God all over the Bay Area. It's incredible to see what he's doing. And I really think that we're seeing right now in this time, this age of pandemic, the final verse I'd like to share with you coming true, and that's verse 23 to close out the Zechariah first half. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew, one person of God, by the helm of hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you you know that's incredible to see that today not not quite 10 but six have taken hold of the hem of someone's robe and said let me go be with you because i know that god is truly with this group because i see the miracles of god i see the vision of God. I'm seeing the dream Come of on, God bro. fulfilled even in my own life. And they go, I know bro. that God is with you. I know. And I hope you know that God is with us. And no matter what happens, if we stay faithful, God's word can never be stopped in this generation. And that is the future glory of Zachariah. I love you guys all very much. Uh, and we have one final song to close out our service. Let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah.